So tonight we're going to interview Christine Watkins and Marina Rostrapo. Wonderful. Well, maybe we can start going towards a little bit about the book, Christine, about, first of all, why did you write this book? Why, why did you feel the need to write a book on this particular issue of the illumination of conscience? Well, I learned about it and I thought, is this real? And I thought, if it is real, I'd like to know the truth about it. And why is this, if this affects the entire world, why doesn't the entire world know about it? So I asked those questions of God and I asked him, is this real? And if so, um, would you like me to write a book about it? And I told him in prayer, I said, you know, I, I would need to meet people that have been through this experience. I feel like that would be important for people to understand what an illumination of conscience is. And at that moment, moment in my life, I'd met one person who had undergone it. And after I said that prayer, I kid you not, I met almost eight other people or five or so, I actually met them in person. And I, they told me they'd had the experience and would share it with me. And then I learned of five others. And the last person was Marino. So at that moment of that prayer, I only knew one person. And then within, you know, eight weeks or so, all these people showed up. And, and since in the many, many years since then, a decade or so, I haven't met anybody. <laughs> So I, I took that as a, a response from the Lord and, and it was a long, a long time in the making. I really wanted to thoroughly research all the mystics. I mean, the, these aren't, these aren't all of the mystics who, who have spoken about the warning and received knowledge of it from God. I, I just picked certain ones. And so this to really be clear, I'm not the mystic. I'm not the extraordinary person. I'm simply someone who did the research. And so I found that it was in the gospel of Matthew. I found that a Pope declared blessed, Pius the Ninth spoke of it, St. Edmund Campion, St. Faustina, blessed Anna Maria Taiji, Father Rodrigue, um, Elizabeth Kindleman of the Flame of Love movement, and I know that Father Jesse has been involved in the Flame of Love movement, um, Father Stefano Gobi, Matthew Kelly, Lusta Maria de Bonilla, these, these visionaries and stigmatists, uh, many of them have the stigmata, also Janie Garza, very holy woman in Texas who has a stigmata and the uh, support of her bishop. And then he, Germany, is a church-approved apparition of children that not many people know about. And Jesus spoke of it to one of those visionaries. And a lot of people know about Garabundal, Spain, where it was um, mentioned in detail. And so this moment in time, um, no one knows when it will happen. But the prophecies that continue to to come to the world seems to be speaking of urgency and closer and closer, perhaps our generation, when the sky will darken, darkness will blanket the earth, the sky will become brighter than day, night will be brighter than day, day will be brighter than day. Jesus will appear in the sky on the cross and from his wounds, bright way, rays will come, they will light up the earth and they will pierce every soul. And each soul will have a brief in earthly time, five to 15 minutes or so, a moment of a life review in lieu of their sins, meaning the things they've done that they were not supposed to do and the sins of omission, things that they were supposed to do but did not do. And we neglect those by the way in confession. And so whether they're Muslim, atheist, new age, wherever they live, wherever they are, it's a worldwide experience because God is seeking a correction of the conscience of the world. And so everyone will, we walk this earth, some people, um, and Marino has spoken of this very well in many of his talks where 
people can be walking alive, their soul can already be in the state of heaven, or they can be walking dead, their soul can already literally be in hell. If they were to die, they would just go right into that new existence. But in the moment of the illumination of conscience, also called the warning, also called the great day of light, also called the new Pentecost, there's many different names. The person will feel not just be in that state, but feel what it is like to be in the state they're in. So a person in purgatory will feel what it's like to be in purgatory. A person who's very close to the Lord will feel what that's like. And everyone will know without a doubt that there's a God. Everyone will know what it is they need to do to change, to grow more in the likeness of Jesus Christ. The problem will come afterward in that the media, which it does very well now, will come in as the new priest and say, well, that was just a solar flare or some kind of phenomena. We don't know what it was. It disregarded. It. it was a collective chaos, a collective mind event that you can ignore. And so my desire, uh, and I, I believe this is why this book that I thought was going to be so small and just for a select few has gone around the world, is because the more people that know about it, the less people will be fooled afterwards and the more people will pass through it with grace. And the more people will do if they can reach the sacraments right now is to do a general confession. It's very, 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 very important to go to a priest and to thoroughly examine one's conscience. That is one of the best things we can do besides leading a holy life to be ready for such a moment. And Marino already has been through this and we know that this is the potential for if all our prayers that we pray for our children, they're not converting, they're not, you know, not changing, not changing. That's a moment when they can, but it does need to be handled very carefully, very delicately, that should we experience such a thing in our lifetime, that we rush to help the people, that we explain to them, that we give them a Bible, we show them who God is, we, we bring them into church, because there will be a moment in time, a grace-filled few days about 40 days say the mystics when there is a mass conversion when the flame of love of the immaculate heart of mary sent forth through the rays of jesus christ's wounds will light us up and so it's very important as well to understand that this is a huge gift a great day of mercy nothing to be afraid of and it's also a gift that we want to put in the, the back of our minds to say to ourselves, I want to be ready right now for that, right now, right now, right now, right now, to, to live in that eternal now of no fear to say, yes, I am living a life where my conscience is clear. I have a clear conscience. There's really nothing more beautiful than living a life in love with God, in love with your neighbor, and a clean conscience. And just to be aware that another reason why I really feel like we have to pull ourselves away from the media a bit because it's going to, it's going to come in and it's, it's going to do what it likes to do is put a secular spin on divine events. Thank you so much. Um, that brings a lot of clarity as well. Like I know in, in your book, you mentioned St. Faustina and how the Lord himself uh, spoke to her of this great moment and even with Gary Bandal maybe for people listening because sometimes there's a lot of stigma around Gary Bandal a lot of misinformation around Gary Bandal about what the church actually says some people have quoted to me that the church has condemned Gary Bandal which is not true originally there was part of a process where some of the bishops did not have time for it you could say but then in the, the most one of the most recent bishops revisited it and found out that the first investigation into the apparition in Garibandal was not taken out very seriously. And in fact, there were lies by the investigators and stuff like that. And when it was given to Pope Benedict, when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, he, he said that the case is still open. So he didn't cast it aside. He didn't reject it. Um, but he said, um, but he, he sort of, in a, in, a, in a way, sort of left it with a sort of a positive affirmation. But 
but waiting still for that full judgment of the church. But but the but the bishop, um, most recent bishop, as far as I know, um, had revisited it and was positive himself towards it. So just to just clarify that because I've come across that. And there's a recent film out on Garibandal as well and a documentary called Unstoppable Waterfall. That's on YouTube. Um, would definitely recommend that. Um, Marino, maybe would you like to just say just something about the your own experience of the illumination of conscience, maybe for those who weren't on our last event? Yes. Uh... I believe that um, uh, Christine has touched uh, a pretty wide um, vision of that particular event. You know, it, it basically is what uh, Christine explained. And also I can share that uh, my experience of illumination of conscience obviously was a personal one. And it began when I was uh, sentenced to death during captivity from the rebels here in Colombia in the jungle and I was completely devastated you know no hope uh, hit bottom and uh, destroyed as a human being and all of a sudden I entered into an ecstasy and and though I was awake and conscious in the cave still I was watching my life from age three on and it was, I was 47 years old that night and, and I was reliving my life. Uh, and it wasn't like watching a movie. I was there at age three on a tricycle with a stick in my hand, going really fast through the gardens of my house, uh, hitting the plants and the flowers. And I was in awe because as you know, an ecstasy is like being in awe and you can't get off. You, you, no matter what you do, you can't get off the ecstasy. So I continue on reliving my life. So that became an illumination of my conscience because I was in mortal sin for 33 years already. My conscience was closed down. You know, conveniently, when you live in mortal sin, the first thing you do is you bring the curtains down of your conscience and you lose the fear of God. So uh, you become completely insensitive to, to your responsibilities, your moral responsibilities. And especially I knew the truth because I, I was baptized, I was educated in the church. So that made it even more serious. So then during that experience, I begin to see myself uh, walking away from God, walking into the world, walking into the realm of the darkness, the Satan and, and the fallen spirits, the condemned souls, all the demons. And, and it was devastating to see that. As Christine was touching on that, I say, if this is going to happen to all of humanity at the same time, you can be sure that it's going to be a massive ecstasy. Because if you go through that, Normally, like we are right now, I don't think you make it, but you probably die because the pain I had, though I was in ecstasy, the pain I was going through, and it wasn't physical pain, it was a spiritual pain, the pain of realizing the sense of sin, the consequences of sin, the offense to God and the damage to my own soul and neighbor is so large that is not possible to even explain it as huge. So I didn't know a thing about these prophecies, but when I came back and became a missionary, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the first places where I heard that from was Garavandal. I visited Garavandal in 203 and I had the, the grace to meet uh, Jacinta, one of the visionaries. And I sat with her for a long time and. So in one of the conversations we had was about the illumination of conscience. And I didn't know there was a prophecy that involved all humanity for an illumination of conscience. So it is exactly that, you know, we will see ourselves, we will see our life in an instant because the whole experience I had could have lasted a minute of hours, but uh, it was eternal for me because it was, 
outside time. So once you enter into an illumination of conscience, uh, you will be outside time because you will see your whole life in an instant, but you will perfectly see it. But when I say see it, is relive it. And not like you are relieving it at the age you are relieving it. You are relieving it at the age you actually are at the moment. So that's what makes it very painful. Because let's say you go to through your infancy. Yes, you do. But the, you will go through your infancy with you, the conscience that you have at the age you are now. So that makes it really difficult when you're dealing with sin. And uh, little things you do uh, as a child, I'm talking about a conscious child, not a child that is doesn't have a sense of reason yet. But it, it, let's say eight years old, seven, well today, five year olds are like 10 years old or before, you know? Uh, but uh, now when you begin to see how serious every scene is, you will detect them very early on in your life. I could see, you know, things that I did very wrong when I was eight years old, really bad things that anybody would say, oh, that's nothing. He's just a boy, you know, it's like, no, it was very serious. And uh, so basically that's, uh, this is a very long subject, you know, we, we can talk about this for a long time, but I touch. Uh, I touched these little so far, you know. Yeah, thanks very much, Marino. That's um, it is very <laughs> helpful to to hear that from someone who has experienced it and who the, can explain it to us from a sort of a lived experience. Um, this Christine, we were talking before everybody came on when we were, we were in our breakout room about Maria Esperanza, the servant of God, Maria Esperanza, and just for those in Trinidad, or maybe even in Ireland, you would have heard of her, but for us in Trinidad and Tobago, there are a lot of pilgrimages at one point going over to the to the shrine in Bethania. And uh, just a quick little story. Um, my my own uncle and his wife, uh, Dave and Gail, they, they, um, they couldn't have kids for, I think, eight years. And uh, they were over visiting family in Caracas with my mom's parents. And they ended up running into a pilgrimage going to Britannia. So they went and uh, my uncle and aunt, they experienced one of the miracles of the sun. They saw the sun spinning, turning green, purple, all the colors, and then breaking into like a million pieces of glass over them. And some people saw it, some people didn't. And uh, my grandmother saw the servants of God, well, Maria Esperanza, and asked if she'd come over and pray with my aunt. And so, the very next month, my aunt conceived, so she was healed. And so she has four beautiful daughters now. Um, mm -hmm. And so I thankfully myself, when I went, uh, hearing all these stories, I, I really wanted to go on pilgrimage. I was probably about seven or eight, so went with my mom and a few friends of hers, and we went um, to there, and I got to meet her, um, which was uh, an incredible grace. And that whole pilgrimage um, was a very special encounter for us in different ways. Um, and I was, uh, yeah. So, would you like to say something? Maria is in the book. Uh, she, Our Lady gave her many um, prophecies or stories. Uh, well, you know, communicated different things, sir. And I know you said when you were praying, she's the first one that came to mind for you for tonight. So I thought that was very providential. Um, would you like to share about that? I think it is because for whatever reason, I've never spoken about her prophecies concerning the warning when I when I speak about this. And um, so I just was praying about what to mention in this conference. And so in the, the book, The Warning, I immediately fell upon there. There are two messages in the book that Maria Esperanza was given regarding the moment of the warning. And uh, I would say she's like a female Padre Pio. Yeah. In fact, he, he didn't know she was around, her soul knew, and she was in a crowd. And he, he pointed out to Maria. And before he died, he said, you're next, meaning he passed and gave, I guess she was 
called by God to be like him on this earth, another soul like him. So that's how extraordinary she is and was. She's, she's passed on, but this is a message that was given by Mother Mary through Maria Speranza. Little children, I am your mother, and I come to seek you so that you may prepare yourselves to be able to bring my message of reconciliation. So she calls the warning in this message. It's about reconciliation. We're reconciling with God, with ourselves, and with others. There is coming the great moment of a great day of light. The consciences of this beloved people must be violently shaken so that they may, quote unquote, put their house in order and offer to Jesus the just reparation for the daily infidelities that are committed on the part of sinners. It is the hour of decision for mankind. And what's so interesting, I feel like we've covered that in this conference. We've covered about the importance of preparing. We've covered that it's a great day of light and why it's a day of light and mercy. And that the consciences of people must be violently shaken. And I think Marino just explained why it's violent. So that we can put our house in order, meaning get right with God, with ourselves and others. And then we've also mentioned and offer to Jesus the just reparation for the daily infidelities that are committed on the part of the sinners. So once again, it's this call that that's the answer. For those leading a just life, the answer is reparation. The, the family that Marino was shown that, that is making reparation for who knows how many souls by the way they live and act and and devote their days and their moments to God. And then the last line is it, that it's the hour of decision for mankind, of which I said, you know, afterwards, we have to make a decision. We have to make a decision right now. But in that moment, the world will have to make a decision because there are going to be uh, bigger consequences than normal on earth concerning whether we choose him or we don't after the warning. So isn't that something that there's that message? <laughs> oh, praise God. No, thank you so much. Yeah, I, I, I remember meeting her and uh, it was very brief. She kind of just ruffled my hair, you know, and she said, <laughs> um, but uh, funny enough, I was saying to you earlier on, a cousin of mine in Venezuela is now the boyfriend of, sorry, the girlfriend of her grandson. Um, so it's just a sort of a little connection there. It's very interesting. It's a small world. Um, uh, I went to, I said to, um, Mar to Christine before that, right before I entered the Dominican order in 2012, my cousins in Venezuela went, brought me on a pilgrimage to Betania so I can give my priesthood to Our Lady. And so I kind of, we made this pilgrimage and it was, um, it was beautiful. Um, so I had fond memories from when I was young and went on that pilgrimage with my mom. Well, do you want to just say something about the flame of love? Um, movement or uh, about you know um, Elizabeth Kindleman um, and and maybe around this area anything comes to your mind or the Holy Spirit inspires you to say something there is a gift that Mary's giving us and giving to the church called the flame of love for the times in which we live where sin abounds grace abounds all the more and this is one of those huge graces which came through an orphan in Hungary named Elizabeth Kindleman. And this is another book on Amazon or queenofpeacemedia.com. You can get it at cost. And there's also cards that go with it. Um, the Flame of Love of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Um, different bishops around the world have approved of it. And it's a private association of the faithful. And so what happened was, um, Jesus and Mary would speak to Elizabeth and what they wanted to do besides mentioning the illumination of conscience in some of the messages is they wanted to give us prayers that would be particularly powerful for our times because they would blind Satan. 
And so there's two prayers that I highlighted them in the back of the book. I felt called to highlight the weekly schedule that Jesus and Mary gave people. There's things you do on each day of the week and beautiful heavenly promises attached to them. So in the back of the flame of love book, you can look at that. And it's, it, it's amazing. It's not easy. There's night vigils, there's fasting, there's receiving the sacraments. If you can, there's long hours of prayer. And the idea is to create truly, honestly, if you were to do all of this, you would be acting as a victim soul, as a soul of reparation, as a soul that gives him or herself for the help of the salvation of the world. And, but just to start off very simply, if you're not up for doing night vigils, which is waking up in the middle of the night and praying for an hour, if you're not ready to do fasting, a lot of fasting, many of us are, we just don't think to do it. And the, you know, the devil wipes that thought out of our head and says, oh, you can't do that. That's too hard. Well, is it really? It's just a matter of the will. It, a lot of it, unless, unless we're sick and if we're sick, we need to uh, moderate the fast in a way that doesn't hurt us. But a lot of doing these acts of reparation, these prayers, these sacrifices is simply a decision of one's personal will. And so one of the beautiful things about this flame of love is that Mary has given us the unity prayer. I have a friend, Father Jim Blunt, he's an exorcist. He says he's never seen anything like the power of that prayer, as well as an additional few words to the rosary that blind Satan. And he says in exorcisms, he, he says that people are freed faster than he's ever seen them freed in the past. So he's actually seen the efficacy of these prayers. Now people, um, and Elizabeth Kindleman herself was shocked. You don't change the rosary. How could you change the rosary? But believe it or not, the rosary has, has changed into what it is over time. Um, there wasn't the word Jesus or Mary in the rosary before. Um, the prayers were hail full of grace and fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Those, those words were not in the rosary, for instance. Um, and as we know, Mary herself added the Fatima prayer. Oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need them. That was another change. And then we know that St. Pope, um, oh my God, John Paul II, he added the luminous mysteries, right? So it wouldn't be fair to say to Mary, you can't do that because <laughs> she has done that and bishops have approved of it. So it's called the Flame of Love Rosary. Um, you can go to queenofpeacemedia.com and click on spiritual resources and you can find a handout of all of this there if you don't want to get the book. Uh, but it goes like this. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Spread the effect of grace of thy flame of love over all of humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So that's the insertion in the Hail Mary. And for whatever and whomever we're praying for, if we say that with faith, Satan just suddenly can't see whatever it was or whoever it was he was planning on attacking. So this is something worldwide that Mary wants us doing. Um, of course, she says the regular rosary is still perfectly good. She doesn't want fights to break out over who to play, pray, <laughs> praise with what rosary. That's not the point. If people reject it, it's okay. But if you feel called to pray it this way or with your family, know that this is a simply an extra grace because of the times that we're living in that her flame of love wishes to bless us and blind the enemy. The other prayer called the unity prayer is most beautiful. And I know Father Jesse said that he started a, a flame of love prayer group. And so this is part of the reason this prayer is so beautiful is because Jesus is saying the prayer with you. You're actually not saying it alone. He is saying the words at the same time we do. And I find that so beautiful, that promise. Um, so Elizabeth Kindleman wrote, my redeemer asked me to say this prayer, which expresses his longings. And um, Jesus also said to her, I made this prayer completely my own. 
Jesus said, through this prayer, Satan will be blind and souls will not be led into sin. It goes like this. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the eternal father. Amen. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, that, that's, it's so beautiful. I, as I explained to you early on, it, it came across my path a couple of times and my own parents, and there was a conference in Trinidad uh, that I know you spoke in Trinidad at the Divine Mercy Conference, uh, which is promoted by the Sanctuary of the Holy Family led by Mona and team. And uh, Father James Blunt was speaking a lot about, about these prayers. Um, and so just very providentially in the last while, it, it kept coming up. And, uh, and so when these things happen, we have to kind of pay attention. And, uh, and just, again, it's just, you know, sometimes when we talk about the illumination of conscience, so people might pick this book up and they're not really aware of sometimes the wider truths of the faith or, or you know, like they can, it can, the devil, because this is such a powerful thing uh, that so many saints and popes and mystics have spoken about, that the devil can come to take away, to disorder our understanding of it. You know, and it can end up with some people with a disordered fear or like, uh, you know, uh, which is which kind of happened through some movements within the church, like Jansenism and stuff. Um, and yet. Um, but anyway, I think tonight, the way you explained it in Marino, it kind of allows us to approach this event in the right way, understanding, yes, uh, having a healthy reverential uh, fear uh, of, of just hurting the Lord or offending him or seeing his majesty and his holiness um, and to, to we should always be really just prepared and, and like you said with that right conscience in, 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 in view of him and so and, but, it, but ultimately this is his mercy and his goodness that he wants to save every soul with his children like St. Therese would say you know she just really rediscovered the boldness that, that we could have in God's father um his and the confidence we have as his children um but and that that love really drives us to make reparation and to change our life live in the, um <clears throat> thank you very much maybe just towards the end um you might lead us in that prayer slowly so we can all pray christine that prayer at the end um and really get that <laughs> get our late, that really open up through uh, that intercession, Mary's great grace is for us and, and to prevent evil. Um, Marino, is there anything you'd like to say or is there anything you feel inspired to come in there with? Well, I, put... um, I must say, Father, that I am very thankful we had this opportunity. First time we share the stage with uh, Christine uh, regarding um, all the great things that Christine has done lately with her books. And uh, so that in one end is a great, a great gift for today, for me and all of you connected and you father for your care and your zeal. So I'm happy that uh, we had the chance to share. And, and regarding the, the topics we touched, they are so immense, so deep mm. and so endless that we could do uh, a million shows like this and we will not touch the surface. So may God have mercy on all of us so that we can all be prepared for whatever comes and especially if an illumination of conscience come while we are here, we need to be ready. Uh, I could add to end that one of the things the Lord revealed to me was that and this wasn't during my mystical experience that time. This is years later. He showed me that every dying person has an illumination of conscience. Before you part the body, the physical body, the flesh, you have, as you, as your soul is leaving the body and entering the spiritual realm is illuminated and it will have the full view of the truth. That's why every human being 
has a chance. And, uh, and surprisingly enough, a lot of souls turn down love. And this is unbelievable. But this is what the Lord showed me. Lots of souls do not go for the love of God and rather go into the darkness. Okay, thank you, Marino. Marino, if, just very briefly, I just feel that uh, in your book there, um, this one, Winning the Battle for Your Soul. Sorry, I have two cameras going on because of technology. I had to have two, two outlets. So sometimes I'm looking in different directions. But you spoke about the power of reconciliation. I just feel that would bring us to a lovely end. Uh, just, you know, maybe just about, you know, what the Lord showed you about the sacrament of confession. I mean, Christine has led us into this with, with what she said about the general confession. But in this book, you say, you know, about on the day of judgment, obviously, when we come to the Lord, those things we've confessed, they're gone. He's forgotten them, you know, because some people can have scrupulosity. Um, you know, the devil can stir us up. People may not trust enough the, the power of the sacrament that it, they are forgiven, that they are, you know. Now, we do have to make reparation, as as you point out, and as the church teaches us, that we, we you know, we need to be purified from, from the wounds maybe in our life. But we have been forgiven of, of the sin. Um, and so anyway, would you, would you, can you just give us a comment on that, Marino? Yes. Um, one of the uh, toughest parts of my experience with the Lord, the first time I first experienced that night uh, in the cave was about the sacrament of confession. Because the Lord showed me how at age 14, I walked away from the sacrament and he showed me how Satan stole the sacrament from me. Because, you know, original sin is about I am. And this is the biggest uh, sin, right? Uh, so the sacrament of confession is the biggest I am not, you know. It's the biggest opportunity for us to die to self and let God. And so if you, if you really think about what that means, that means completely the deliverance from original sin because original sin is about satan telling eve you are because if you eat this you will be like them you know you are and and that's the killing of the only i am who is god you know and that's the big sin so the sacrament of confession is the true deliverance of that sin that's why jesus was so eager when he resurrected to give the power to the apostles to forgive sins or to retain them. And then the Lord showed me how the moment that Satan stole from me the sacrament, I became so weak spiritually and so strong in my flesh, so strong as I am, as, as one I am, right? And that was my life astray from God. Uh, so he says, um, the priest has the biggest power on earth to unchain us from satan and it is through the sacrament of confession but we have to be sure we have to be sure that we make a very sincere confession because satan is always involved with confession always because it is the biggest threat to the devil to confess and he he hates humility uh, if, if, you, if you're humble enough to kneel and confess your sins to another sinner, that is the biggest humiliation to the devil. He can't stand that. He burns him. So it's like a deliverance. It's just like an exorcism. So um, going to confession is going through a deliverance. You go and clean yourself up if you do a real confession. Like Christine was saying, it's very important to have a real, a really, a real good confession of your life. And every chance you get, go as deep as you can in confession. Uh, always watching for scruples, you know, because you don't want to become a scrupulous, but you want to become meticulous, you know. So that's very important to do. And uh, so the second confession, once the priest raises the hand, to give you absolution, be sure that you are changing planes. You are moving from the dark into the light instantaneously. Uh, when I had my first confession, uh, after I came out of my kidnapping, 
um, that was, I was happy to be freed from the guerrillas by my, my biggest uh, worry was to be free from Satan. So confession was the big thing I needed. So when I made it to confession to a Franciscan convent and the, it was a long confession, and at the end, at the moment, this priest raised the hand to give me the absolution. I heard the most amazing whining that went deep, 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 deep down into the earth, like, like a, a big, big whining. And I knew who, the, who those were, you know, and, and he killed them, you know, he just blew them away completely with his hands, you know, so it's very powerful. If people will know how powerful the sacrament of confession is, they will go to confession very often. I can bet you that. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Marino. Powerful. Maybe just, how would you say to someone about maybe being meticulous? What's the difference that you think between scrupulosity and being meticulous? Well, meticulous is being very honest, sincere, uh, very particular, uh, go into details about what you need to clean up, to straighten up. Uh, and that is far from, that is exactly the opposite of a scrupulous, you know? Me being meticulous is, being, uh, is looking for perfection without becoming perfectionist, you know? So, uh, so it's very important to have that meticulosity which is the, uh, the art of being precise, the art of going for perfection in your deeds, in your work, in your conscience. Great, thank you very much. Um, great. Well, I think uh, <laughs> this has been wonderful. I think we've learned so much tonight <laughs> um, between yourself, Marino and Christine. It's been a real honor to have you on, the two of you. And please God, maybe we can do something again in the future, um, looking at different things or even, you know, different mystics in the book or different teachings. Um, can we, can we, maybe Christine, could you lead us in that uh, unity prayer, um, just line by line, and we're all going to say it, we'll stay on mute, but we'll all pray it from our homes, and we'll have this amazing prayer going up all over the world, um, and, uh, and yeah, just the, the joy of, 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 of the Lord curtailing the action of the devil. And I also really want to recommend um, Marino Restrepo's books, uh, Pilgrims of Love is his organization. And so if you haven't, um, you can read his story in this book in the warning, but also um, from darkness to light is, is his book that has his story. So um, I think it's a, it's a potential conversion experience in and of itself to read his story of, of what he went through. So thank you for sharing it over and over again, Marino. And I, I thank you, Jesse, Father Jesse. I, I think this was wonderful. Who knows if it's the beginning of more, but I, I love you all very much. It's, it's very comfortable and a joy. It's just a joy to, to serve him with you. And you're just amazing men. I know I'm not supposed to bow down to you, but I won't, but I bow, it's, you know, I can't help it. Okay. Oh. Um, <laughs> so I, Maybe I can help the viewers by, I don't, I, I have this memorized. I'll probably mess it up for the first time, but um, I'm going to put the unity prayer on the screen. Great. So together, I think also I'd like to say that a way to avoid scrupulosity is to realize moment to moment how we're loved beyond all telling. And it's all about love. It's all about love. So we, we're not perfect. Uh, we, we strive to be better each day and God understands our weaknesses and he loves us all the same, just the same. There's never a moment where he withdraws that love. So if we walk in that love and we bask in that love, that's a great antidote to scrupulosity. So in this prayer, Jesus will be praying it with us. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. 
May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. And may our lips pray together to gain mercy from the eternal father. Amen. Amen. Amen.